Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming this morning to find out if this guy is really falling or not. Are we to the point where we need to uh, take our money and bury it in the backyard? Uh, that's the a question I want to answer this morning. Is the county's money safe because I've heard some banks are failing? So let's talk about some of these things. First of all, why do you have a vested interest in this? Well, uh, first of all, this is a Photoshop thing. We don't actually keep the money in the window system. Um, the, the, these are your tax dollars, so that is your vested interest uh, in this topic. Uh, but let's be honest, it's also, oh, he, did you, did you, uh, there we go. It's also what funds our payroll. So we want to know, is the money going to be there safe? And then two weeks from now, is it still going to be there safe? And two weeks from then, that's really what we want to know. So you've probably seen these memes before that say you had one job, right? You see the, the yellow line painted down the street and then all of a sudden it kind of waves off and then, you know, it's like, oh, come on, you had one job, paint a straight line, right? So when people think about what I do, uh, I've got really only one job. Now, this is my favorite example of this, the guy that was in charge of uh, mounting the privacy doors in the restrooms. Right? You, take, you walk and take a look at that, and you think, well, I'll just hold it till I get home. Um, but they, they just had one job, right? And they didn't get it right. So if I, as a treasurer, you don't know all the hundred different hats I wear, you don't know all the things that I do, but if I only had one job, you know what it is, and we could all say it together, keep the money safe, right? Well, nobody said it with me. Maybe you guys don't know. Okay, well, maybe some of this will be new to you. If I only had one job, it's to keep the money safe. <laughs> because if I don't, nothing else matters. So all these other things that I do, uh, the way we account for and keep the different funds separate, uh, the way we pool the cash together in management, a very efficient way to centralize the treasury services, uh, getting a return on the investments. It doesn't even really matter if I reconcile the bank accounts if the money's not safe. So today we're just going to talk about that one thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, because really the question is, is Justin, in this environment, can you even do your job? Or is the sky falling? Well, here is my uh, philosophy on this. Yes, I actually do believe the sky is falling, but it happens very, very slowly. In fact, ever since I've been a kid, the sky has been falling. Things have been happening. Uh, things get us all excited. We've been scared that the world is going to end, and it's been happening since I was a kid. So yeah, it's happening, but it happens very slowly. And this is what my financial advisor told me many years ago. He says, you're trying to prepare financially for what might happen in the future. But the end of the world is only going to happen once. So what good is financially trying to prepare? You, well, let's put it this way. You cannot financially prepare for the end of the world scenario. What good is the money that you buried in your backyard and you kept safe when the dollar fails and the federal government defaults and everything's shut? It's not going to do you any good. So when we talk about the end of the world scenario, we're not, we're not trying to financially prepare for that scenario. Because if you're worried about that scenario, the only person that can help you is Jesus Christ. And I would love to tell you more about that, but that's not the purpose of this meeting. Call me sometime off the clock and I will tell you about preparing for that scenario. But today we're going to talk about how we might financially prepare for the rough times, but we're going to stay out of the end of the world scenario. Uh, so before we can talk about the banks failing, uh, before we can talk about what's happening, uh, we need to understand some very simplistic, maybe overly simplistic uh, 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 concepts of how a bank works. First of all, let's talk about the expansion of the money supply. Uh, the pessimists would call this, well, they're just creating money out of thin air, right? Well, it really happens. <laughs> 
and and this is how it works. Uh, Jeff has been really wise with his money. You all know he's really good with money. So he saved up $10,000 and he goes and he deposits it at ABC Bank. All right. Now, I haven't been so um, <laughs> wise with my money and I, I need a new car and I don't have the money saved up. So I have to go to ABC Bank and I borrow $8,000 to buy a car. Well, Jeff just made a deposit. Now they've got his $10,000, and when they count out my loan, they actually give me Jeff's money to go and buy my car. Yeah, Jeff didn't know this, but they did. So I go, I take the $8,000 I borrowed from the bank, and I go to the seller of the car, and I trade the money for the car. Now, the seller of the car is counting Jeff's $8,000. But what's happened here? Jeff looks at his banking app, or if he's old school, he gets his bank statement in the mail, or maybe he calls up the bank and says, how much money is in my account? <laughs> well, Mr. Scott, sir, you've got $10,000 in your account. But the seller is literally holding his $10,000 in his hand. And alacadabra, there's $18,000 out there. Now, this is offset by the fact that I owe uh, uh, the bank $8,000, but I don't have to pay that back right away. I may be paying back a couple hundred dollars a month for the next three or five years. So this could create a problem. The bank is only holding $2,000 of Jeff's original 10,000 that he deposited. And I'm only giving the bank a couple hundred dollars a month what if Jeff wants his money back faster than that? This is a problem. Well, eh, no, it's not, because you understand that in the banking world, this is happening hundreds of thousands of times over. So they just simply use somebody else's deposits to keep Jeff happy when he wants to go and close out his account and get his money. Um, and so there's plenty of cash on hand. And even though I'm going to take three years to pay back the loan of... Uh, the, the bank has also made other investments with the, the money, maybe uh, bought some U.S. treasuries and, and other investments that are very easy to turn around and sell on the open market immediately for the cash they need if many depositors try to pull their money out at the same time. So even Justin's loan, they could go and maybe sell to another bank uh, uh, and, and so these are all assets that a bank has and they're marketable. Uh, and so banks are watching this, they're managing this. Um, and what they might also do, maybe they just say, Hey, we're growing, we're making lots of good loans to, uh, to, and, and good investments. So let's just raise deposits. Maybe they, uh, offer a little bit higher interest rate to their depositors to encourage more deposits to come in. There's lots of ways a bank keeps this in balance. So let's talk about rising interest rates because this has put a lot of pressure on all banks, not just the four that failed this year, but all banks. Uh, this has been difficult because in our example, let's say it was two years ago when Jeff made his deposit at ABC Bank. And at that time, when he opened the savings account, they said, uh, Mr. Scott, we'll give you 0.25%. We'll give you a whole quarter of a whole percent of interest to keep your money here. And that seemed really good a while back. And so uh, they're paying Jeff only $25 a year to use his $10,000 and loan it out. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe my car loan was, uh, you know, 6%. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe they bought other investments, uh, real safe investments like a U.S. Treasury bond. Um, and maybe they locked in. Uh, at 2% for five years, because back then everybody thought interest rates are zero and they're going to stay zero for a very long time. So let's lock in two or 3% for five years. Some of the banks did a little too much of that. And so now with banks paying higher interest rates, Jeff goes to the bank and says, you know, I'm no longer satisfied making a quarter percent. I want to take my money out of your bank because I'm going to go down the street where they're having this uh, special where I can get a CD for uh, four or five percent. And if too many depositors start doing that, then the bank starts to get to the place where they have to sell some of these investments in order to 
start paying off their depositors. And this is a problem because if a bank is holding on to investment, even if it's a real safe investment, and it's only making 2 or 3%, uh, nobody's going to give them 100% of the value of that investment. So they're going to have to sell at a discount. They might uh, have to sell that investment at 97 cents, 94 cents on the dollar. I've seen them at 89 cents on the dollar just because of the difference in the interest rate, even when the investments and the assets are perfectly safe. And so the banks can begin to lose money and get into trouble and feel pressure. If they did not position themselves and they could not adapt well to the rapidly raising interest rates uh, and that environment. So let's talk about bank failures now that we understand some basic principles. Uh, these, uh, th this is a graph of the number of banks that failed, and it's kind of hard to see that. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, in the last 23 years, 565 banks have failed, closed up their doors. Uh, typically, only a few fail each year. Uh, it's typically only a handful. But of course, when we went through the global financial crisis, over 80% of the failures that have taken place in the last 20 plus years took place in that little window of time from 2008 to 2012. Um, that was that global financial crisis where you remember all these banks were failing. In 2010, that's at the very peak of, of, of that uh, mountain there in that graph, 2010, at the very top, 157 banks failed that year. So the question becomes, in the news we've heard of a couple banks failing, four have failed this year. Why are we panicking? Like, what's the big deal? And why is it making headlines? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, no banks failed in 2021 or 2022. So we got kind of used to the fact that you know, no bank, you know, that everything's really stable, everything's working just fine. And then all of a sudden, four in less than, you know, the first half of the year, that seems a little bit much. But it's not just the number of banks that are failing, because you all understand size really does matter. In this graph, um, and well, I guess we can't really see it too well, uh, but this is, this is uh, the, the top seven bank uh, failures by asset size of the bank the top seven bank failures in, uh, in history. And what you'll see is the first one is from 2008. That was Washington Mutual. Uh, that was the, the biggest one back in 2008, uh, kind, of the, the, kind of the beginning of the financial crisis there. But then in places, in second, third, and fourth place are three of the four banks that have failed this year. So it's not about the number of banks that are failing that's making the big headlines. It's about the size of the banks that are failing that's making headlines. Here's another way to look at the information. The red line is the number of banks that have failed. So you see it goes way up during the crisis and then comes down and it just kind of stays flatlined. But the green line shows you the asset size of the banks that failed. So you see there was a spike there in 2008 with that Washington Mutual deal. And then you're going along and then all of a sudden this skyrocket of we can see now that the asset size of the, the cumulative asset size of the banks that have failed this time were bigger than during the financial crisis. And so that's why things are are a little bit scary, a little bit unnerving. So what causes this? <clears throat> well, insolvency was the problem way back in the financial crisis. Uh, let's go back to our example. Jeff had deposited his $10,000 at the bank. The bank turned around and loaned it <clears throat> to uh, Justin to go uh, buy his car or to buy his house. And... Justin just walked away from his mortgage, decided he's not paying that back, right? Uh, the, the, it turns out the house isn't even, is no longer even worth what I owe on it. And so Jeff's money was just simply gone. The deposit was gone. And so it was a problem of insolvency. The bank just lost the money. But this time, it's a little bit different. It's not necessarily insolvency that's causing the banks to fail. <clears throat> a 
A lot of the problem are these rising interest rates that's putting pressure on the banks that we just talked about. And really what it comes down to is a good old fashioned classic, contagious run on the bank. Um, this has been uh, remastered in color, uh, but most of you probably saw it in black and white who've seen It's a Wonderful Life, right? This is the savings and loan. You got George Bailey there. Uh, uh, thanks to Jimmy Stewart, we all understand what a run on the bank means. A and thanks to Jimmy Stewart, we've all had the education to understand that when we put our money in the bank, it doesn't necessarily stay in the vault the whole time, right? He explains to us, well, well, well Jeff, well, you, you, your money's not here. Well, why, why, it's loaned out to, to, to build Bob's house. So we all understand that the money is not in the, in the bank. But nevertheless, that makes us scared. All of a sudden we understand, oh, the bank doesn't have everybody's money. I better go get mine, right? Because that's what happens in a pandemic. What? There's a shortage of toilet paper? Well, by golly, I don't care if the rest of you can wipe your butts. I'm going to have a warehouse full in my backyard. Everybody just thinks about themselves. But this time, there's a little bit of a twist on the, on the bank run. There's a little bit of a twist because back then, people are running through the street telling one person at a time what's going on. They haven't seen it in the news. They don't know what's going on, but their friend tells them. And then they all <clears throat> they get their umbrellas because it's raining that day. They all run. They stand in line at the bank one at a time to get their money. <clears throat> What happens today? Oh, there's a headline. Maybe my bank is not doing so well. I don't know if this is really a problem or not, but that's easy. I just moved my money to the other bank account that I have. Welcome to the new speed of money. This is difficult because banks now, you know, the time it took them to you know, they're going to have to sell some assets in order to, you know, keep up with, with people pulling deposits early. This is a game changer. And uh, when, when people get scared, they can move their money out of that bank in an instant. Silicon Valley uh, announces the, a significant loss in their bond portfolio, all right? Now, this is, remember our earlier example is they had bought a lot of, like, U.S. treasuries and so forth, paying sh smaller interest rates back when that was a good deal. Now interest rates have skyrocketed and they're sitting on these investments that are not worth so much because they're paying lower interest rates. Now people are yanking money out of their bank. and or, Well, before that even happens, on the books, people just look at their books and say, oh, you're holding on to investments that have a market value that if you had to sell them, would not be worth enough to cover the deposits. And so people begin to get scared. And in two days, two days, $42 billion left that institution. That's not from people telling one person at a time and standing in line to get their money, all right? That's happening very quickly. Everybody at the same time pulls out their banking app and just fixes the problem. They didn't even know if there was a problem. In fact, they helped create the problem they just moved their money. Two days later, Signature Bank was seized by the FDIC in a very similar fashion. Huh. I heard SVB isn't doing so well, and I bank at Signature, and they seem to have some of the same profile, so yeah, I'll just move mine just in case, right? Better safe than sorry. Uh, psychologists tell us that we create what we fear, and when people and businesses begin to fear the safety or accessibility of their deposits, then they start doing things that, sure enough, begin to compromise the accessibility and the safety of everybody's deposits. What are some of the things that people do when they get scared? Well, diversify is good. Uh, how about um, I just go and, and, and keep my money in several different banks? That way I've always got access to some, even if a bank were to fail. How about I move from a smaller bank to a larger bank? Because you know the federal government, they'll bail out the big guys that are too big to fail. I'll just keep my money in that bank and uh, take it out of the, the, the small and mid-sized bank that I'm in. 
or if I distrust the banking system as a whole, I'm going to go buy gold. Or maybe the banking system is too complicated. I don't really understand it, so I'm going to do something that is a little more, uh, is something that, is, that, that, that everybody understands a little bit better. I'll just keep it in cryptocurrency. I know I don't have to explain that to you. Better safe than sorry is what actually some of the large depositors were interviewed and asked the question, and they, well, you know, we didn't really know if it was that bad, but we were just better safe than sorry, and it was easy to move the money. Right. Because it's just so easy. In fact, this guy tells me I'm the commercial. I can do it in just five minutes. I mean, isn't that the easiest decision in the history of decision making? That's what he says on the commercial. So it doesn't matter if there's even really a problem or not. I'll just move it just in case. So here are some of the contributing factors to what caused a run on these banks. And, and, and also some of the problems that um, caused them to fail. Because what happens is, is people, you know, a bank's information, their balance sheet, it's, it's, it's public information. And so when analysts get to looking at it, these are some of the reasons that, that these, these banks were having issues. 45% of uh, Silicon Valley's banks' deposits were in the tech industry. Uh, now, we bank, our, our main depository is UMB. That's where the county keeps most of, of its main banking relationship and services. And UMB won't have any more than 6%. Uh, in any particular industry because they want to be diversified so that if something happens at a certain industry, it doesn't rock the boat. So 45%, I mean, Silicon Valley Bank, I mean, come on, what do you think mostly they're into is the tech industry. So what happened in the tech industry? Well, it skyrocketed unsustainably during COVID. Everybody needed to go virtual. They needed the, their uh, virtual meeting subscriptions. They needed to send employees home uh, to work virtually. They needed uh, all of these services. They needed to uh, step up their websites. They needed to sell online. They needed to go from, you know, to curbside sales. The tech just exploded during COVID at an unsustainable rate. And so now when every other industry is still trying to add jobs and not every tech uh, business is, is, is like this, but as a whole, the industry, they're still kind of shedding those extra jobs that they put on during that boom. And Silicon Valley Bank had quadrupled in size in five years. You know, imagine growing at like almost 100% every single year for that long. Um, it's hard to manage that responsibly. The four banks that failed, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, Silvergate, First Republic, uh, each had multiple characteristics from the following list. They did not all have all these characteristics, but they had, but each of them had multiple. Uh, first of all, we already talked about it. They were heavy in the tech industry, both their borrowers and their depositors. Uh, they made heavy purchases of long-term U.S. Treasury bonds, we talked about that earlier, those safe investments, but that are paying a low interest rate. It was good back then, but they locked in that low interest rate for a long period of time, and they could not adapt to the rising interest rate environment. They were heavy in cryptocurrency, several of them. That's not surprising. <clears throat> and they felt that they could have survived. Some, most of them did, or, or some of them thought that they could have survived if it hadn't have been for that run on their deposits, that, that immediate panic pulling of, of money. They, they, you know, we could have recovered. We could have been just fine. We just couldn't recover from that. And of course, you can't have a problem without blaming management issues. So let's just throw that in there as one of the contributing factors. So <clears throat> when we think about you know, our money and our bank, is that safe? Well, there's this thing called FDIC insurance, and all banks have to pay into this pool of insurance uh, based on their size and their risk level, just like you pay insurance for things uh, to, to keep you from having a huge financial loss from something you can't afford. 
They pay into this FDIC insurance. And what happens is, is when the, when the bank looks to like, they're getting to the point where they owe more money to depositors than they're actually worth all of their assets combined. The, the, the FDIC steps in and seizes the assets. And what they do is they, they liquidate those assets. They sell those investments, they sell those assets. And then they've got the money to turn around, and start paying the depositors. And when that money runs out, that's when they go to that insurance pool of money and make up the difference to pay off all the depositors. Uh, it works just like uh, any other insurance, like I said. And in the 90 years that it's been in operation, no one's lost a penny of FDIC insured deposits. So they've got a good track record. And as you know, your deposits used to be uh, 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 insured up to 100000 Now it's 250000 But in the cases of systemic risk, like these big banks that just failed, the, the FDIC is authorized to do more. And so that's why you heard on the news they're saying, no depositor is going to lose their money because they insured those deposits, even those people that had tens of millions of dollars in those banks, they insured those deposits totally, not just up to the 250000 And that was because of the fear that, of the panic that would take place if everybody found out that the people were losing their deposits from these huge banks. So the FDIC did more. And so, of course, everybody's like, oh, so who's going to do something? We got to do something, right? Um, well, that's a, a, a slippery slope and a balance to be kept because there's legislation that's being concerned, uh, considered to make the FDIC insurance more uh, or maybe even infinite. Uh, and that is the best thing in a short-term crisis because it calms everybody's fears. Oh, okay, everything's safe now. But... There are very responsible banks that would have to keep paying higher and higher insurance premiums to bail out those who are irresponsible. If you make that insurance, uh, if, if you take away the cap on that insurance, there would be people who would act irresponsibly because it just doesn't matter. We'll, we'll, we'll get bailed out. So they have to be very, very careful not to reward unscrupulous behavior. So, okay, I feel better about my deposits because I've got less than 250000 but doesn't the bank have a little bit more than that, like $150 million? So how is that kept safe? Well, what's not FDIC insured is collateralized. Remember, the bank has those assets, all those investments. We actually, by law, make the bank uh, have an agreement that uh, that those assets are pledged to a third party and that if the bank fails, those assets automatically revert to the county to make us whole for, the, for our money that they lost. So we actually would seize the bank assets before the FDIC gets a hold of it in a failure situation. And that's how the county's money is kept safe. And that's how it's done uh, by law. <clears throat> we also utilize this... Um, uh, network called an IntraFi network, where uh, we deposit money at the bank, and the bank can then turn around and trade those deposits with other banks that have municipal, governmental depositors as well at $250,000 a piece. So let's say we put a million dollars in there, that bank turns around and trades that deposit $250,000 a piece with four other banks in the network and it's all FDIC insured. So these are a couple of tools that are in our tool belt in order to keep the money safe. And it actually works because uh, when I, I saw this, the headlines of Signature Bank failing, I pulled out, this is my February um, uh, bank statement, and, and I'm going to the, the 50 banks because uh, we actually got about $20 million in this network. And they're, you know, so I'm looking through the list of the 50 banks that our deposits have been traded with. And sure enough, Signature Bank back in February was on our portfolio at just under the $250,000 FDIC insured limit. So I called the bank. Mr. Hill, don't panic. Um, it, it, it's a non-issue. Well, I was like, well, do we need to uh, fill out an application? Do we need to uh, file a claim with the FDIC to get that deposit back? No, it's already been taken care of. They simply, as they're paying off those depositors, they move those deposits to a responsible bank. Um, uh, this, it, 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 it's already taken care of. You don't have to do a thing. Sure enough, we get our uh, statement the next month. 
Signature Bank is gone, and a new bank is in its place at the same dollar amount. Didn't lose a penny. Didn't have to do a thing. So uh, the system system works. Now, I think I've already used up all my time and probably uh, even more. So uh, uh, I, I guess technically you're dismissed. I'm going to stick around for the 9 o'clock meeting that happens in here in a little bit. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to stick around and, and, and talk. Thank you.